good afternoon students and welcome to national science centers you know from today onwards we have opened our museum for you again after lockdown period and today on the occasion of world science day we have organized a special lecture for you on plant health and social well being so to inaugurate this special lecture we have with us shri n ramdas ayer our senior curator i will request him for his welcome address a very good afternoon to <clears throat> all the viewers who are viewing this program and are waiting to listen to this lecture so today as uh my friend mr malik said is a special day because today is the world science day it is also the international day for science museums and science centers and it is also the day when we have reopened national science center after about 6 months of being closed because of the covid pandemic and i take this opportunity to welcome you all back online here and i also will look forward to seeing you all at the national science center to visit our galleries and exhibitions in the coming days now the topic <coughs> of today is very interesting it is about plant health something which not many of you may have uh, thought about very deeply you see much of the things that we get are from plants directly or indirectly and it is very important that the plants themselves remain healthy we had uh, last year inaugurated an exhibition here called super bucks the end of antibiotics it is uh, it was an exhibition on whether antibiotics are becoming useless and cannot control infections anymore now as a part of a solution to this major global health problem who has declared a one health policy one health policy is that we cannot be individually healthy a person i want to be healthy i want all my colleagues i don't care about them they may be healthy they may not be healthy they may fall sick or all human beings will be healthy but i don't care much about animals or all animals and human beings are healthy i don't care much about plants these approaches do not work anymore and the policy of one health everything everybody even the environment should be healthy because we are all part of the whole plants get their nutrients from the soil and from the environment water and other things we consume plants get their nutrients from them some animals consume plants some people consume animals and get their nutrients from them and then we pollute the environment we you know create a lot of problems in the environment in addition each species in among plants among animals even among us have got enemies have got parasites have got pests which prey on us all and because of that this one health goal becomes a problem that is why we have invited a very reputed professor of botany today to talk to you about plant health incidentally plant health is the topic uh, it, it is the topic chosen by the united nations the united nations chooses a topic every year a topic of great relevance and this year it is plant health and we'll also be making an exhibition on plant health very soon we have a very eminent professor professor kotapalli srinivas rao uh, i request my colleague 
uh, Mr. Kailash Chandra to introduce the speaker of the day after which we will go directly to the lecture. Thank you all for being here. Good afternoon viewers and uh, thank you sir for giving me a chance to introduce the speaker of the day, uh, Professor K.S. Rao, who is presently professor in the Department of Botany, University of Delhi. Uh, he was born on 3rd July 1958, Guntur in Andhra Pradesh. He obtained his PhD uh, in 1987. Uh, a few a few um, uh, minutes before we were talking about his interest. So he has traveled extensively in Himalayas during his field visits and collaborated with various, various several international scientists on various aspects of mountain developments. His present academic work relate, related to natural resource management and sustainable development in Himalayas and biodiversity assessment on crit critical ecosystems in hill and mountain regions. This is where he, uh, his academic research lies. And so far, because he is in the, is a very senior post and he has already supervised 18 PhD students, written 25 books on different topics related to botany and he has also to his credit 150 research papers which he has presented at various uh, platforms. So he has been awarded uh, <clears throat> Vishist Vaganik uh, Puruskar in 2005 by Ministry of Environment and Forest, Government of India. Uh, he is a UGC National Swami Parmanand Saraswati Award he has got for Ecology and Environment also in 2006. And also Professor NAM Environment Lecture Award in 2016 by Madurai Kamaraj University, Madurai. So he is currently Fellow of National Institute of Ecology, International Society for Plant Morphologists, Andhra Pradesh Academy for Sciences, Linnean Society of London and Indian Botanical Society. So we are privileged that we have such a, I mean, highly uh, uh, knowledgeable person as a speaker of the day and he will be speaking on the topic plant health and social well-being and this relates to the international year of plant health for 2020. So over to uh, Professor T.S. Rao sir, over to you please. Okay, good afternoon. So let me start my presentation. I hope you are able to see my presentation. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. <coughs> so I have chosen this topic plant health and social well-being because the social well-being is ultimately what we are looking forward. So the plant health is what we are today interested in. So let us go ahead. So today it is a very important day for us. It's World Science Day for Peace and Development 2020. And uh, we are actually uh, looking forward for this day in terms of the strengthening the public awareness of the role of science for peaceful and sustainable societies and thus uh, to reduce the drudgery that the entire world where the resource uh, anything hello is it okay yes yes sir. okay so to promote the national and international solidarity for shared science between the countries and they renew national and international commitment for the use of science for the benefit of the society and lastly draw attention to the challenges faced by the science in rising support for the scientific endeavor and it is important to understand that a lot of problems that the human society currently is facing could be resolved by the science and its development. The United Nations General Assembly has identified this year as an important part of the plant health for the society. And thus it is important for us to 
understand why this topic was chosen and we also has to know what this plant health actually means so if you look at the year is once in a lifetime opportunity to raise global awareness on how promoting plant health can help end hunger reduce poverty protect the environment and boost economic growth if you look carefully this things so the most critical one is the world is facing a lot of problem in terms of the food insufficiency in some places and excessive production at other places and how we could achieve the equity and reduce this hunger is also going to be one of the important agenda at the international level and we need to look at the reduce poverty every country is trying to look at how to reduce poverty and natural resources is the only way we could actually produce the resources that are required for providing economic opportunity and in a country like india lot of people are dependent on agriculture and this natural resource production itself is going to meet most of the people's requirements in terms of the both resources and also their economic development and thus the plants are going to be a important component in terms of how we manage the resources so what this plant health and why it is important so a healthy plant is able to grow and produce and can face the environmental stress pests and competition so similar to us human beings a healthy person could face the stresses pests and competition the plants also can do the same thing and thus it is important to understand what plant health means the food and the natural resources supplies are always coming from the plant sources for a, a predominant part so some people might be dependent on animal resources for their food requirement but without the plant resources these animal resources can also vanish and thus the plant products are going to be the most critical in terms of providing the energy in terms of the food and also resources that are required for the society to progress a range of variables affect the plant health including the surrounding environment and the extent to which they are protected from the pests and diseases so it is important to also understand the environmental parameters which are influencing the health of the plant similar to the human beings plants also interact with the environment in winter we feel chilly in summer we feel heat and when we feel thirsty we water is not available sufficiently in the body so plants also face similar issues and thus the environment plays a important part in terms of the ability of the plant to be healthy or vulnerable to the pests and thus environment plays a important role in terms of the how plants maintain its own health and thus able to provide the resources the healthy plants are vital for to sustainable and profitable crop production and to qualify quality and cost of the nation's supply of food fuel and fiber health is also critical to plants used for ornamentals natural resources and animal feed scientists are using innovative methods to breed more productive and nutritious crops advances in breeding and genetics are allowing farmers to grow plant varieties that are healthier and more resilient to drought and losses from the pests and diseases so lot of students might have heard that genetically modified crops are coming and especially today in india we have a lot of discussion whether we should allow them or not a lot of developed countries already using this genetically modified food um, crops to meet their requirements both in terms of the food and industrial requirements in india currently we are allowing only the cotton which is a non food item otherwise we are not at fully geared up in terms of accepting the genetically modified food and thus we are already 
in looking in terms of how the naturally available variants of the agriculture crops are able to meet the requirements of the food that is required for the growing populations of our country. As I said, the United Nations has declared this year as the International Year of Plant Health and we should look at what the objectives of this program. So, this year is declared with the objective that raising the awareness of public and political decision makers on global, regional and national levels about plant health and its contribution to these three factors and to promoting a strengthening of global, regional, national plant health efforts in light of increasing trade and new pest risks caused through climate change. And this is one thing one has to keep in mind because a lot of places this climate change impact is clearly visible and especially that developing countries is facing a lot of issues in terms of meeting their requirements in terms of food and fodder due to the changes induced by the climate change. Rallying global, regional, national political support for plant health and this is going to be important. If you look at the published work, you understand that a lot of countries take a lot of precautions in terms of regulating their products that are coming from the other regions because the pests that are going to come to their countries could wipe out the entire crop production in those regions and thus the countries take extreme care in terms of how to manage these things. So increasing global, regional and national resources for plant health policies and systems is the fourth objective that was set for the International Era for Plant Health. So now let us come to our main topic that is how the plant health is related to the human well-being. To understand that, we have to first understand how the human well-being is and how it is measured. The human well-being is or the society, which I said, humans in terms of me, is we are talking, looking at the society, anthropogenic society, and thus human well-being is a broad concept, one that includes many aspects of our everyday lives. It encompasses material well-being, relationships with family and friends, and emotional and physical health. It includes work and recreation, how one feels about one's community and personal safety. So you may ask, how all these things are related to the plants? A psychometric study that has been conducted in US has shown that young children who were exposed to a lot of greenery has more mental peace and well-rounded development as compared to those students who has been constantly into the build-up environments like concrete jungles and they were always had problems in terms of understanding the, their lessons and all and lot of psychological issues and this shows that the plants has ability to keep the human brain into a stable state and thus provide soothing environment for the people to keep focused in terms of acquiring knowledge and thus have a capacity building effect in terms of the human development. And thus greenery and surrounding is going to be critical. It is also said when you are doing physical exercise, if your surroundings are green, you have better effects as compared to the those people who are working more in terms of the built environments indoors under the air, air conditions in the gyms. So, open air physical exercise is considered to be the most important part in terms of the physical exercise for the students and those people who are growing. The Commission on Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress identified eight key dimensions that should be taken into account when defining human well-being. So, these are the eight. Of these, today we are focusing on the health 
and the environment which is influencing the health. This health could be both the human health and also the plant health. And today we are going to focus more on the plant health. The measuring human well-being requires the subjective act of defining and creating models and measurements of that which defines health and quality of life. And this we will not discuss too much because it is going beyond the our scope of current day's lecture. To understand why we have so much of diversity, we have to understand how this earth has evolved. So if you look at these pictures, you could see that in the pre-Cambrian period, about 650 million years ago, there is a big ocean within which a small land mass that has developed, which is Gondwana land, and then it has grown and slowly in the early Cambrian Carboniferous period, about 365 million years from today, back, it has started moving towards the northern pole from this existing southern pole area. And by the upper Jurassic period, about 150 million years, the continental plates, as we are seeing today, started breaking up. And today, about end of Cretaceous period, about 65 million years ago, before the actual the humans are uh, stepped in, in terms of the evolution, as this continental systems has formed, which we are looking at today as the various countries organized in the different countries. And the green areas that you are seeing is predominantly vegetation rich zones that are having the diversity. And this vegetation it, the evolutionary period has changed from the unicellular organisms to the multicellular big plants that has been harvesting the greenhouse gases and thus able to help the humans to have better life on this earth. So to understand this, we have to look at what are the plant systems that are existed. And in the plant kingdom, we call the distribution of the plant wealth in various agroclimatic systems as the biomes. The map shows the major geographic regions defined on the basis of dominant plant growth forms. So you will be seeing that the as you move both towards the polar regions, you have the cold adapted plant varieties dominating the ones, so the conifer plants, and thus you have the polar region plants, then the temperate region plants, and as you move towards the equator, you will find the tropical and equatorial plant varieties that are dominating. And the tropics are rich in terms of the biodiversity because it has a lot of environmental variables that are resulting in evolutionary changes and thus the greater speciation that is occurring and thus you have lot many varieties of the plants that has originated and accumulated in the region. And why we need all these variations in terms of the plants that are supporting the, uh, providing the resources for the human society. So let us look at these two maps, A and B. Which one is healthy and which one is unhealthy? So you might think that there are a lot many plants and thus this could be healthy and few plants here, it is unhealthy or otherwise you say these plants are more thicker so it could be healthy and these are the thinner plants, they are unhealthy. From a different perspective, you could say some are healthy, some are unhealthy. Here, these are old plants and thus still continuing to grow and thus you could consider them healthy. The densities are lower here and thus the resources availability is sufficient for the plants to sustain. Here, the plants are young and they are more dense and there is a resource competition and thus they might be under stress and could be considered as the unhealthy for the time being. But you require to have high densities also to get by the old days into a healthy forest which could support the carbon sequestration and thus able to provide the services that are required for the human society. 
So to understand the what are the signs of the plant health, let us look at. So here in the pictures, you have the healthy and unhealthy plants. And in terms of the ability to absorb the sunlight, you have the amount of the light that is being reflected back is also given here. So in general, layman terms, we can say the leaves are dark green in color for a healthy plant. It has good flowering if it is in the flowering stage. There are no signs of pests or diseases apparently visible from the observation by our naked eye. So what is the unhealthy plant then? So an unhealthy plant will be looking like wilting. There could be pest damaged plant parts that are visible and the growth could be poor. So some of the pictures in the both the slides you could see that the pests are creating lot of damage to the plants. So you could see a classification of the pests that are doing damage to the plant given into this map. And we will come to this at a later stage. To understand the utility of the plants and its health, you could look at the diversity of the plants that are available in India. You could see a predominant part of them are going to be critical in terms of what has been already identified and what has not been identified. And if macro organisms that are clearly visible to the naked eye are the ones easy to identify. So scientific knowledge has accumulated in terms of identifying a lot of plants. And in terms of the viruses, bacteria, fungi, these plants, a lot of those which could be easily cultured has been easily identified. Those that cannot be cultured by the humans, it is difficult to identify, but some efforts has been done using the genetic markers, some identifications of them. And it is estimated that while we are able to identify about 85% of the macro diversity, we were able to document and identify only about 20-25% of the micro diversity of the viruses, bacteria, fungi and other organisms. And thus, a lot of these organisms is still has to be identified, documented, only then we will be knowing whether they are really useful or creating harm to our society, both either directly it, 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 causing diseases to the humans or could be indirectly by causing diseases to the plants and animals which are providing the resources to our society. So here, let us take a look at some of the interesting plants. We already know that uh, ginger provides us good health. Turmeric is an important plant. Similarly, a lot of condiments are available in our cooking systems. There is a lot of diversity in the tomatoes that we consume across the world. The size variation, the color variation could be seen. Our most precious resource, the banyan tree, you know, tulsi, the asimum, the moringa, the drumstick. And I would like to emphasize here, this is not really identified as a major resource in India, but this is a lifeline resource in African subcontinent. It is rich with the vitamins, minerals, and is consumed a lot. The leaf, the flowers, and the fruit, all are consumed in large quantities. And today, a lot of people are looking at exploring the possibility of establishing this as an industrial by exporting the dried powder of Moringa leaves to the Africa as a, one of the important business. And you might be interested to know this uh, insect trap plant, Nepenthes. And in the coastal regions, you will see a lot of plants, Rhizophora, that are interesting in terms of the protecting the coastlines from the cyclones that are coming and damaging our land masses. And 
flowers are important, but this flower is important in terms of uh, reducing the pests in agriculture fields and thus the tagetus has an important role in terms of uh, reducing the pests. And here you could see the major crop plants, the rice, wheat and the corn that are providing the food for the human society across the world. These are the three main grains that are meeting the more than 85% of the food resources that are required for the world human population today. I also would like the students to understand some of the interesting plants. This is Ulfria globosa, the smallest angiosperm, which is a flowering plant. So this is an aquatic plant and it is so small that it can pick up several hundreds on your fingertip. And a lot of work is happening on this plant to understand how this single cell plant is able to produce the food resources that are required and thus able to have a lot of nutrients that are accumulated and could be considered as a super food for the future. And in terms of it uses at present, we know that at least the in Thailand, lot of people use this and it is considered to be very important food for them. And in the Thai cuisine, in especially Isan making, people use this as the important ingredient. The other plant I would like to give you an introduction is the dwarf mistletoe. And this is another very small plant and that has been creating a lot of damage to the big forests that are existing in the across the world. This in, in example I have picked up is the Himalayan one, but you have similar concentric species across the world which occurs as the endophytic plant inside the phloem and only when it has to reproduce it starts producing small green parts that are bulging out of the bark and thus completes its reproduction and the propagules that has been the seeds produced are transported by both the insects and the wind and start establishing themselves and they could stay for a few years internally without even reproducing and could damage the entire plant. So the plants get weakened by infection of this minute dwarf misting toy and lot of forests Specifically, the coniferous forests have this as a major problem. The other mistletoes has been infecting the broadleaved forests also, but these minute mistletoes are an interesting angiosperm that people are trying to look at and what are the uh, genetic markup of this plant which is enabling it to stay as endoparasite for a pr prolonged period of its life cycle and then appear as uh, for reproduction outside the plant and complete it. And when you ask which is the most useful plant, in Southeast Asia, people simply say bamboo is the most useful plant. Why? It is said to be from credit to the credit to the coffin, this plant is used in most of the regions. And it is also a considered to be most important food item in the entire Southeast Asian region. And in Northeastern region, this plant is providing a lot of employment in terms of the both as the food and also as the industrial resource. And you could see this entire Buddha is prepared by the bamboo by weavers. And in terms of uh, this providing the medicinal value, in terms of providing construction material, in terms of uh, providing food 
is considered to be the most important resource and in northeastern region lot of pulp production for the paper industry is dependent on bamboo and thus the best paper is considered to be produced by the bamboo pulp and today if we are looking at the resources the india is having a lot of diversity of this plant and management of this resource is going to be very very critical for us a lot of plants are underutilized in the region and our food basket is going to be enriched if we properly understand all these plants you might have seen this jungle jalebi uh, and other plants which are used as the eatables for the children when we are going at the school and the vegetable diversity that you have seen and all these things are getting attention and thus we have a lot of diversity which need to be protected from the pests and pathogens to support the social well being of the region and this is a period lot of us enjoy eating this fruit and in the summers we you this kafal or mylka and nilambo and all these resources are going to be critical in terms of supporting the food diversity that india has if you look at the number of species and genera that are supporting the food requirements under various categories of the fruits vegetables nuts and industrial crops pseudo cereals and grain legumes you could see the diversity is very high in terms of the fruits and the vegetables the grain legumes as you know we use three major main grains and then the cereals pseudo cereals are the other ones which the predominant population are using why we should be worried about the plants <coughs> the plants provide all the resources and thus they provide a lot of ecosystem services this is well but what one has to see is we also have this serpentic potential value so we don't know yet for some of the plants what the real contribution of these plants and thus it is important to protect these plants for future possible discoverable uses to the human society lot of new medicines are rediscovered it is not we don't want to say that they are going to be discovered they might be already known to our traditional medicine system but in terms of what is the active ingredient how to resynthesize them in the laboratories and provide better cure to the people is going to be discovered and thus it is going to be important for us to understand why these plants produce these resources and what these plants are going to be useful in terms of the future for the human society is going to be critical for us to understand so why the plant health is important plant health is important because plants also have the pests so what is a plant pest the term plant pest means any living stage of any of the following that can directly or indirectly injure cause damage to or cause disease in any plant or plant product so it could be a plant protozoan a plant protozoan uh, a non human animal why we have put non human is humans are also a pest on the plants because they require their food from the plants itself but for the human point of view all animals which are non human animals are considered to be the pests because they are taking away the benefits that are required for the human society a parasitic plant a bacterium a fungus a virus or viride an infectious agent or other pathogen that could be identified 
so now let us take some snapshots at the pathogens that we know so the fluorin necrosis is happening in the coffee plants because of the protozoans and what are these protozoans the protozoans are the ones like the amoeba paramecium like structures and these could be infecting the plant the fluorin resources that are transferred the photosynthesis to the various parts of the plant is being consumed or obstructed by the protozoans is actually causing the necrosis and the necrosis is like uh, it is disintegration of the tissues and thus uh, you will not be able to have the functional ability of the plant and this is a major cause of the loss of the coffee production in india and across the world so the protozoans are causing major economic damage the other organisms like the fungi bacteria nematodes and viruses let us look at what they are doing so the example of the fungal disease science are rust leaf rust stem rust and white molds and powdery mildews so you could see the leaf rust it is happening on the predominantly the graniaceous plants and in the stem rust also then Sclerotina is going to have the white mold, so you will find a lot of wild, you know, sticky like fungal um, strains coming out, uh, and then the powdery mildew, which is predominantly affecting a lot of leguminous crops, uh, is going to reduce the crop yields, and thus the fungal organisms act as the pathogens could. Cause diseases to the plants and does a major problem to the plant health. Bacteria also act as a major source of the diseases. You could see the bacteria infected fruits and the stems started showing the Streaming the water. So you have the plant pathogens which are causing such diseases. They like the crown gall, the fruit spots, leaf spots, or the cankers on the lemons, etc. actually and thus is reducing the photosynthetic efficiency of the plants and thus the plants are not able to perform optimally and thus plants are unhealthy. Nematodes eat away the root systems and thus are damaging the plant health and these microscopic animals actually is causing major agriculture damage in the regions wherever they are and in the plantation crops these are considered to be the a major source of yield losses because in the nurseries wherever the nematode infection is already existing it could be transported to the other places where the plant material is transported and spreads its Acres and thus could be damaging, and especially in the plantation crops, nematodes are considered to be a major problem, especially in terms of the banana, cashew, and uh, other plantation crops. The phytoplasma is the one which is a lot of interesting organism. It is something like a mycoplasma-like organism which is unculturable, it is flowing limited insect transmitted plant pathogen and it 
has a structure different from the bacteria which could be said that it doesn't have a rigid, rigid cell wall and it causes a disease that we call as the phylloidy and phylloidy means it's just like like witch's broom so it gives a cancerous growth of plant material and thus you will find that the growth is not a uniform and it is not a healthy growth and insects also plays important role in terms of the as the plant pests and could be hampering the plant health you might feel that a lot of these are butterflies moths they are really interesting plants but as a adults they may not be doing much damage but as a juveniles they are all eating away the leaf and thus reducing the photosynthetic ability of the plant and thus damaging the plant health you have flies you have other organisms and these are acting as the herbivores on the important plants for the human society and thus reducing the plant health and thus creating problems to the human welfare two of the important pests agriculturally considered to be across the world a this is the white grub in himalayan region it is very very common it is called kurmula in uttarakhand region and white fly is the other one which is a major pest across the world and in africa it is considered to be a devastating pest especially for the major crops that are growing these are the two major pests that are considered to be most damaging to the world populations food requirements and considered to be a important pest like other major pests let us look at why we should be worried about these pests on pathogens in terms of the major food supplier that the wheat rice and maize that are meeting the world's largest populations food requirements you could see the southeast asian uh, south and east asian region where india is a major contributor has about 10% of production loss in the wheat about 59% of the losses in the rice and about 7% in the maize so if you consider this rice and wheat as a major crops of india which are meeting the food requirements about 60% and 10% of grain losses yield losses is going to be a predominant loss for the growing populations in our country you could see that our yields are pretty low it is less than 2 tons per hectare in terms of the wheat in terms of the rice it is just above the 2 tons per hectare and in the uh, maize we don't have much of the contribution so let us not concentrate there so you could consider if with the low yields as compared to the other developed countries in terms of the wheat and the rice you have a predominant part of the loss then we are actually losing more than 50% of the rice yields because of the pests and the pathogens and if we don't do proper care we could be actually keeping 50% of our population under hunger because we have lost the yield that could actually meet their food requirements and thus understanding the plant health and how to maintain it is going to be critical for the human well being or the social well being for the society like us so plant diseases are also spreading across the world very quickly and this is because of the plant material is moved we have been importing lot of planting material from various countries because of our industrial requirements let us look at some of the 
important diseases that has been considered to be spreading recently. See, white pine blister rust, chestnut blight, Dutch elm disease, dogwood anthrocin, pit cranker, port or ford cedar root disease, sudden oak death. Sudden oak death is a major death that is reported in the European and American continent and also in the Himalayan region you will find a lot of this has created problems. In the terms of insects, the Asian gypsy moth has spread across the Europe and the Americas. The Asian longhorn beetle also has spread a long. Citrus longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer and cyrex nicotina and other coleoptera insects. So the coleopterans are considered to be the major insects that are spreading across the continents and has causing lot of damage to the plant health and thus creating lot of issues. How does these diseases are spreading? These diseases are spreading because of the disease triangle. There is susceptible host, there is a pathogen which is virulent and then there is a favorable environment. So when you have all the three together, then the intensity of the disease is, is, is very high. So when you have only susceptible host, but not the pathogen and the favorable environment, the disease incidence is not existing or very, very low. When susceptible host is not available, pathogen cannot act as the disease causing organism and thus there is a possibility of no disease. And when the environment is not favorable, the disease incidence is going to be extremely low even when the susceptible host and the pathogen is available. And thus, this availability of the, all the three factors are going to be critical in terms of the disease triangle and the spread of the diseases is happening because we are increasingly providing favorable environment by altering the environmental conditions in which we are growing the plants. The pathogens are freely moving because we are moving the uh, growing organisms freely and thus we are providing the susceptible host and thus we are completing the, the disease triangle and thus expanding the plant health problems across the globe because we are concerned with the, our economic development and in the pursuit of economic development, we are also increasing the risk for the plant health. How do we assess the plant health problems? The, especially we take an example of the pest risk assessment flowchart. If we look at the, in the initial stages, we look at the, the pests, the pathway, the policies that are existing in each of the countries or the regions where these organisms are currently going to have an impact on the agriculture production or the economic crop production. And then by looking at the published information, we look at whether we should consider that as the important problem or not. Then, once we identify thus, it is going to be an important problem, creating large-scale yield losses, then we start looking for the pest risk assessment. We categorize the pests into various categories and then look at the, what is the economic losses it is going to cause and then if the risk is not acceptable in terms of the amount of the losses that it is going to create, then we go to the pest risk management. And then here we have to look at the various options. There is biological management, there is integrated pest management opportunities, then we also have to go for a lot of pesticide treatments which is also adding to our problems to the human society in terms of the contamination and the environmental pollution. And thus, we have to be very careful in terms of identifying the pest risk very early so as we could take proper precautions and thus could reduce the further steps in terms of the 
reducing the chemical pollutants that we need to use to reduce the pests and does help the plant health. So, what are the institutional support we have in terms of the plant health management? So, we have under the Government of India, Ministry of Agriculture is the nodal organism uh, organization that is uh, looking after the plant health management. The Department of Agriculture and Cooperation is an organization vested with the powers and the Directorate of Plant Protection, Quarantine and Storage, which is headquartered at Faridabad, is the one which is looking after this and it is looking through its various stations and the organizations that are under it to restrict the spread of the diseases and thus able to maintain the plant health management facilities that are required for the better management of plant health in our country. I would like you to see a small video which has you can identify this pest that has been coming from the western region and reached up to the Delhi and considered to be created havoc in the Gujarat, Haryana, Maharashtra, Locust. and Rajasthan. So, in local language, we call it as the Tidde. And this three days has a very short generation period and they have been causing a major havoc periodically. So every four or five years, this population suddenly grow to that level and causes extensive crop damage, not only in the agriculture fields, any plant material that is available across anywhere is totally eaten away. If a tree swarm settles down at a given area, all greenery material is eaten away in less than a few hours and thus it is going to be a major problem. And this year, which we had a major problem of COVID, also has a tree coming from the western region and creating a lot of damage to our agriculture systems in the region. So at the international level, who regulates the movement of the plant and plant pests? So internationally, we have International Plant Protection Convention. Under this agreement, the countries that have signed this convention takes care of the protocols that are required to move the plant products from one region to the other region. At the regional level, in our region, the International Plant Protection Convention regional organizations, the our region has Asia-Pacific Plant Protection Commission, which looks after the movement of these plants and plant products along with the pest and disease-causing organisms. In our country, the Directorate of the Plant Protection and Quarantine and Storage is the organization that is looking after the <coughs> requirements. In the state level, the state departments of agriculture and products across borders, even when you order from the online sources. And if you remember, recently there were a lot of news that unsolicited plant seeds has been sent to various people across the globe. And if we unknowingly use those seeds, could have been initiated a lot of diseases, so which we don't know. And thus, one has to be very careful in terms of uh, getting the proper goals from unknown sources. We should have proper clearances, and thus, it is important for us to respect the regulations and take care that we don't introduce any pathogens or pests that could damage the plant health and thus could create major problems to our human well-being. We have to be careful when taking plants and 
plant products with us when we travel. There may be spread plant pests and diseases. Several countries take strong penal action on persons infringing plant health laws existing in their country, especially Australia and New Zealand. They are very, very fuzzy now. They don't allow you without cleaning your shoes to enter their country when you land at the airport or the seaport. It is thoroughly clean and only then they will allow because they consider the foot and mouth disease with a major cause of wiping out their dairy industry and animal protein production facilities because they are major animal husbandry countries and dust coming along with the shoes are considered to be a possible pathway through which that could travel from one country to the other countries. Be cautious when ordering plants and plant products online or through postal services as small packages can easily bypass regular phytosanitary controls. It is mandatory to seek prior clearances to get such products for both consumptive and non-consumptive uses. And we have to seek, uh, seek the plant quarantine certificate for getting these things. And if you look at export and import business today, all plant products actually go through these quarantine regulations and only then the products could be actually exported and imported. And you might have heard that mangoes, which are a major product that are exported from our country, were not able to get export permit this year because there has a lot of quarantine issues with it. And similarly, we will be looking at in terms of the things that are we are importing from various countries, how they could be introducing new pests to our region. Spread the word about plant health on social media and in your community throughout the 2020 and beyond. So as you contribute by your own uh, efforts to protect the plant health and thus able to provide well-being to our society. And thank you for your attention. I also thank the National Science Center, Delhi, for giving me this opportunity to interact Camera with you all. Camera. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for such a enlightening lectures. Really, it was very nice to listen to this wonderful talk. Even I think people have some questions. I will request all the audience who are listening, uh, seeing this uh, uh, lecture through YouTube, may post their question on chat box so that we can ask Professor Rao to answer them. In, in, in meanwhile, I would like to uh, introduce Professor Rao to one of our colleagues. She is actually your student. Hello, sir. So, yeah. she suggested your name for the lectures <laughs> only. So, yeah. Professor, now, actually, yeah, any question? Yeah. My yeah. question Go is ahead. the way actually we are emphasizing on quantity to produce crops, how much quality is reduced? Are we doing some research in this field? We may have. See. We, <clears throat> when we are talking about agriculture production at least, yeah. both quantity and quality both are taken care because the varieties that are released are specific to specific agroclimatic zone. This means that we are releasing a quality variety that are suited to specific agroecological zone and thus we are able to provide quantity also. No, for example, actually now there are two types of tomatoes in the market. Okay, yeah, what, what is the desi and the <laughs> desi hybrids and English. you are talking and about. And you see that the, everyone wants to have a desi tomato more, although they are also selling the other tomatoes. But the people want desi tomato still. That means the bitterness or the other taste uh, you find only one type of uh, tomatoes. So, see, here is the uh, trade-off. 
see when you want to increase the production you will be losing some of the important traits of the plant so by increasing the fruit yield you will be reducing the plant's ability to invest in terms of producing some of the secondary metabolites so what happening is desi variety which is good in terms of giving that tinginess is not having good shelf life to increase the shelf life and the increase in the product the genetic breeders has done a breeding strategy through which they were able to introduce the characteristic the traits that are required for increasing the shelf life and the yield has been introduced into it and thus you are having the hybrids which have longer shelf life and better yield okay one more thing which i would like to know from you is lot of pesticide and fertilizers are used for productions so urea mainly they said that urea has which we are using for increasing production has impact on human also is there some study which uh, says all these things are just myths popular among us see the urea is a nitrogenous fertilizer yeah it's uh, can contaminate the ground water so in the places where the human society is predominantly dependent on ground water for their domestic needs like the drinking water could have some health effects because excessive nitrogen in human blood stream could cause the blue death disease so the, you have this problem but predominantly urea is volatilized and thus you have the less problems so increased use of urea if the environmental conditions are not favorable could lead to pollution but when the conditions are good the plant uptake is so fast i don't really see that it is this is basically the problem is the farmers are using the urea in a proper doses at the proper time or not sir one tawassum rocky has put a question in chat box how can large scale organic production can be improved without using any chemical fertilizer you see we cannot meet the entire food requirements of the growing populations only through organic production okay so there is limitation certainly but at the same time you could have a chemical agriculture in those areas where environmental conditions are conducive so as you could have the maximum production and in the regions where environmental conditions are not conducive you could still continue to have the organic agriculture the major part like the western ghats himalayan region are still considered to be predominantly organic states and if you look at the government policies also sikkim has declared itself as the organic state uttarakhand has declared itself as the organic state and predominant hill agriculture is still organic because the amount of the fertilizers and other pesticides are used in very limited quantity in such areas and thus we have to have a trade off between the industrial agriculture versus organic agriculture you should look at meeting the food requirements of the growing populations and also has to balance it out with the the environmental conditions in which the organic agriculture could be expanded sir there is one more question is there any mosquito repellent plants Artemisia is considered to be one of the important so in, in uh, natural systems you use it as a dew plant. Okay. You, you, you Artemisia is also extracted as a medicine also now for the malarial diseases and uh, uh, in uh, biological control agent the tacitus oil which is extracted is used to, to control the malarial uh, mosquito larval. Uh, so can you guide this because most of all we will be students what career yeah. prospects they can have in this field 
see uh, it uh, plant sciences itself is the major backbone in for the life so if we can understand the properly the functional activities of the plants there is a lot of possibility currently if we are looking in terms of the microbiology we have so much of industrial opportunities in terms of industrial microbiology entire medicinal production from the biological sources is totally dependent on our understanding of the microbes all industries are dependent on microbial or plant produced sucrose or the starches or sugars or the enzymes so we could look in terms of the people opting for job oriented courses where they get trained so if you look at most of the genetic engineering areas that people are working they are looking in terms of producing those novel enzymes or novel chemical compounds from the plants or the microbes so as you could provide better economic opportunities to the society by knowing the plants or the microbes that could produce these important economic resources and thus the student should understand in each region what is the variation that is existing a simple example we all consider the neem plant as the taken granted but look at neem starts flowering very early in the south india by the time it starts flowering in the north india the fruiting is already over in the south india but if you look at the yield quality of the oil it is greater in south india as compared to the north india in north india almost oil yield is negligible why the abiotic conditions the dryness that is required is not going to come during the critical period that is required so it is important to understand what are the characteristics of environmental parameters that are required for the plant to have these secondary metabolites so as we can have a better production israel is progressing in such a way in entire desert conditions without much of water availability they are able to produce all the food requirements all the industrial resource requirements in their country within the protected agriculture they are having and also able to export resources that is the important thing one has to learn so if we can understand how to produce plants in protected conditions we will be able to provide with limited land and water resources the food requirements or the industrial product requirements for the future generations so thus students could understand these requirements easily from the their education sir one last question uh, actually recently locals problem tiddy del jo aaya tha to people started beating drums and thalis and other thing does this really helps see it is just trying to uh, scare away the animal acha so uh, the human strategy you might have seen from the beginning of agriculture the humans try to scare away the pests mm-hmm. so always they used to have a machan and then staying there putting the drums or sound making the things or light reflecting things and uh, in the worst scenario they used to have fire in the agriculture field so as the insects that are attracted to fire used to come and uh, get, they eat all the herbages and thus uh, our strategies of making sounds and uh, doing this thing is simply you are getting them move away what about you uh, yeah we had lost a connection yeah i am back. <laughs> uh, yeah, back okay okay sir so i think uh, we have a very wonderful session today thanks a lot uh, professor k s rao sir and did uh, we are all benefited with your this lecture and uh, since our museum has opened now we would like to have one more lecture from you live in our auditorium and uh, as the school start open 
we'll plan for a live lecture again at our center thank you very much maybe for the, i think that for the students the diversity plant diversity is going to be more interesting so we could show them with a lot of pictures the diversity of our country yes uh, probably we could organize it whenever it's uh, possible yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you very much sir thank you very much for sparing your valuable time sir so nice okay well, thank you sir welcome thank you sir thank you and thanks to all our viewers also on youtube okay, okay so okay. keep on uh, visiting our website we will be coming with more and more program like this thank you thank you very much thank you